Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm glad you could join us on this early autumn evening. And um, I want a quick reminder uh, to silence your cell phones and other distracting devices. <laughs> and we can get started. Um, my name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of the Dorman Williams Public Library, I welcome you to this special evening with about mystery novels with um, Sarah Stewart Taylor and Fred Berry. And I want to give a quick thank you to the Woodstock Community Television for recording the talk. It'll be available later on their website and our website. You can share it with whomever you wish. And also to our co-host, the Yankee Bookshop over in the corner, mm -hmm. and who uh, generously donate a portion of uh, proceeds from book sales at these author events in the library so we can continue giving um, presenting programs. And I encourage you to sign up for our mailing list. There's a little sign-up sheet in the back so you don't miss anything coming up. So, so Sarah Stewart Taylor, I've known her and introduced several times. <laughs> she's a former journalist and teacher, and she lives with her family in Heartland. She's the author of the Sweeney St. George series set in New England, and the Maggie Darcy mysteries, which set in England and uh, in Ireland and Ireland. And her new book, Agony Hill, is the beginning of a new trilogy, I understand, and it features uh, Franklin Warren and set in the mid-1960s, which for those of us who weren't here, um, it was a time of great social upheaval. The interstate was coming through, the hippies were coming up. Um, mm -hmm. It was, it, Vermont was going through a lot of changes and she captures that amazingly well in the novel. Uh, Sarah's been nominated for an Agatha Award and for the Josh Hammett Prize and her mysteries have appeared on numerous best of the year lists. And on to, to her left is <laughs> Flynn Berry, who lives nearby in Norwich. And she is a graduate of the Mishner Center for Writers at Brown University, and she's a recipient of a Yaddo Fellowship. Flynn is the author of Under the Harrow, winner of the 2017 Edgar Award for Best First Novel, A Double Life, which is a New York Times book review editor's choice, and Northern Spy. Uh, which was named one of the best 10 thrillers of 2021 by the New York Times and the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Her new book, Trust Her, is a continuation of the sisters' story from Northern Star, the two sisters in Northern Spy. Um, uh, they, you, you learn more about what happens after, after that novel ends in Trust Her. But I just learned that Northern Spy is being adapted by, for a film by Netflix. So we'll to hear, maybe hear some more. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the evening over to our audience. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Liza. Thank you so much, everybody. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we're so happy to be here. And um, we, I think we thought we would each sort of talk a little bit about our most recent books and then um, really kind of jump into a conversation with each other about our books, about writing, research, uh, the writing life, and then we want to answer your questions. So if you have questions or anything you'd like us to talk more about, um, hang on to that. And at the end, we'll make sure to save a lot of time for that. Um, so do you, do you want to start and and tell us sure. a little bit about Truster? Sure. Um, also, I have to say that Sarah is a dear friend of mine. Yes, same. And, and, and it's, it's so much fun to be it here. It is with really you. fun. It's really, I'm so uh, glad she also read my book in manuscript and gave me some of the best feedback that I've gotten, which really helped me revise it. So it feels very fitting to be sitting with her now, having been uh, at the start of the process with her, basically, um, on this book. Um, and thank you, Liza. Thank you, Carrie and Christian. So Truster is set in Dublin in a near future imagined Ireland in which the sectarian violence of the Troubles has returned to Ireland. It's a continuation of Northern Spy, which was the book before, which is set in Belfast and which follows two sisters, Tessa and Marion, as they maneuver between the new IRA and the British security forces and the police. Um, I really wanted to write about the women who I'd researched from the Troubles uh, and their stories and how sort of ordinary lives would be ruptured by violence in a time of conflict and how someone might respond when pushed in those scenarios. Um, it's also about motherhood and sort of friendship and there's a love story. Uh, and most of all, it's about 
kind of survival in the face of violence. It's a terrific book. I was, I felt very lucky to get to read it early and um, uh, it's really, it's, it's just, I, I just think you're one of, one of the best line for line, uh, metaphor for metaphor, like just most beautiful writers who's, who's writing in this space now. So it's, it's, it's it was such a pleasure to get to read your book. Um, so I, um, I, my, my newest is Agony Hill. And as Liza said, it's the first um, in what I hope will be a new long series. You never know. And, <laughs> and the, you know, the writers, uh, we, we can plan ahead, but it does, things don't always work out exactly the way we want them to. Um, but I, I have my fingers crossed. Um, and it, it's set in 1965, in the hot summer of 1965, when uh, a Boston cop named Franklin Warren arrives in the town of Bethany, Vermont, to take a job with the Vermont State Police. And um, he's, uh, he, he's, he's fleeing something tragic back in Boston. Um, and he kind of hopes that this new job, this new hometown will be a fresh start. And he's barely unpacked when he gets a call that there's been a suspicious fire up on a road called Agony Hill. And he heads up to investigate. And before too long, he's got a lot of questions about the fire, about the farmer who died in the fire, about the farmer's family. And um, he discovers that there are a lot of people in town who didn't like this guy and perhaps had reason to want him dead. Um, he also has a lot of questions about his next door neighbor, who is a, um, as we say, a woman of a certain age uh, named Alice Bellows, who uh, ha grew up in Bethany, but then had a, had a sort of, uh, had a marriage and a, a life, uh, mostly lived abroad and in Washington, D.C., because her husband was, was in the Foreign Service, um, and was probably connected to the intelligence world. And so Alice has had this very expansive life and has now moved back to her hometown as a widow. And um, she's a little bored uh, and uh, <laughs> she is getting involved in some different investigations and mysteries in her hometown. So she and, she and uh, Franklin Warren form sort of a, an uneasy alliance, uh, a friendship um, and uh, things kind of go on from there. So, uh, so yeah, so that's Agony Hill. And um, I, you know, I think I, I, I'd like to start off by asking you a little bit about research because that yeah. it's one of my, I know you love doing research and I, I also love doing research to the extent that sometimes I have to stop myself totally. from doing research <laughs> and actually write the book. Um, and so, yeah, tell, tell me a little bit about, tell all of us a little bit about your process of researching um, all of your books, but in particular, the, the Irish novels. Yeah, um, I know we both love it so much. <laughs> so I found researching these stories such a joy and so immersive. Um, I spent time in Belfast to research and in Dublin. And the thing that always, surprises me is that if you tell anyone in the world that you're writing a novel about that, someone with a job like theirs or a story like theirs, and you think that their story is very difficult and that it's often misunderstood, they will tell you everything. <laughs> They'll tell you absolutely everything, even things that probably they shouldn't and that are kind of detrimental to their reputations. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to Belfast and I uh, researched the BBC because my character is a producer at the BBC. and. At one point, I was in the BBC staff kitchen wearing a lanyard and making tea and felt like I had sort of just jumped right through the rabbit hole and was inside my book in my character's um, shoes. And then in, in my time in Belfast, I also interviewed former IRA members. I interviewed a counterterrorism police, police officer. Um, and one thing that I found really interesting was that the conflict of the troubles is one in which like many, everyone thinks that they are the good guys and the heroes. And so I found people really willing to talk to me because they wanted to describe why they had done what they had done 
and how they thought they were building a better future for their children or for the next generation, even if the outside world would consider them maybe terrorists or murderers. Um, and then I did a lot of archival research as well, particularly about women, because women in the Troubles tend to get left out of the main sort of historical uh, accounts, although that's shifted now. Um, one woman who has a story that I absolutely adore is named Rose Dugdale. She was an English debutante who was presented to the queen. She was born into a wealthy family on a sort of um, country estate in England. And then she studied economics and became a Marxist, and she became a supporter of the IRA. And in the 1970s, she planned what was the biggest art heist of the time up until then, where she stole a Vermeer painting to use to ransom IRA prisoners. And she never really gave interviews. She was pretty reclusive in her later life, but until very recently, the only sort of hint of a public profile that she had was a Twitter profile where her profile picture was an icon of the mirror painting that she had stolen. Um, and I just love that sense of um, defiance and resistance. So she was one of the people in the struggle who really thought that she was ending colonialism and creating a better future, particularly for the working class. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the research just is, it's such a kind of spider web where I would pull on one thread and it would lead to 10 more, which is partly why I wrote two books about the same characters, <laughs> because I couldn't stop researching. Um, and I, I'm so curious as well, because Agony Hill, for anyone who hasn't read it, has a really particular atmosphere. It reminds me of like a thunderstorm on a summer's day where you have kind of like golden wheat fields and then these glowering clouds. So you have this kind of like rich, almost syrupy, um, landscape, and then this really atmospheric, moody kind of pulse coming, which I love. And I think it also feels very particular to its time. I was wondering how you researched both the landscape, and I was hoping you would talk about that, yeah. and also the setting. Yeah. Era. So, um, so the so this is the first historical fiction I've written, um, and and so I, I had to approach it in a very different way from. Um, from the other novels I've written, you know, even even the novels set in Ireland, where I had to do a lot of sort of location research and history research, but they were they're still mostly contemporary with you know with a few forays into the 1990s, which um, I, I can't bring myself to call the 1990s historical fiction, <laughs> but some people do, <laughs> some people actually do. Um, but, you know, and I know there are people who, in this room probably who are horrified that I'm calling the 1960s historical mm -hmm. fiction too. Um, but, it, you know, it was, it was a really different process to, to sort of start this novel. Um, because I had characters and I had an idea for a, for a plot, but I really needed to steep myself in that sort of mid 60s, you know, what was going on in Vermont and what kind of cars people were driving, what kind of refrigerators they had, um, you know, little things like, uh, te like telephones. So in 1965, there were towns, multiple towns in the Upper Valley that still had party lines where you would pick up the phone and you'd have to get you know, you'd have to tell your neighbor to get off the phone so you could <laughs> use the line. And, you know, I heard so many wonderful stories from, um, from my, my father and aunt and uncle grew up in the Upper Valley and, uh, had, you know, were, were my, I guess my dad had moved at that point, but my uncle and aunt were still living here in 1965. So I had lots of great, um, you know, lots of great people to talk to and, and to ask questions. And, you know, I heard stories about it you know, you'd, you'd learn things about your neighbors on the party line <laughs> because you'd overhear a conversation that you weren't supposed to overhear. Mm. Um, and I actually wrote a scene in which a character was on a party line, and, and but then I fact-checked it, and it turns out that the, the Bethany is a fictional town, but it's sort of, it's a bit of a mashup of, of Woodstock, actually, and of Windsor, and there's a little Chester, a little South Royalton. It's kind of a, a combination. And um, towns that size in 1965 had all become direct dial. So I had to go back and change the scene so that 
the character direct dial. So, you know, things like that, that um, were really, I mean, were really fun that I really enjoyed. So, you know, I talked to a lot of people. The other big thing that I did was newspaper archive research. Um, I spent a lot of time just reading the newspapers from the, the period. I went, you know, at one point I spent a couple of weeks kind of just reading the Rutland Heralds and the Valley Newses from this, the period that's in the book, which is sort of, you know, August 13th to August 25th of 1965. And after, after doing that, it almost felt like I had, I had sort of like fallen into a, a, a different language in a weird way, if that makes sense, but that I, you know, I was, I, I, I was thinking in terms of what things cost mm -hmm. in 1965 because I'd been reading the advertisements and I'd been reading the classified ads and the stories that were, you know, were in the paper at that point, um, were, you know, really were, were weighing on my mind. And, and there was a lot going on in August of 1965. Um, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. Mm. Um, at the end of that summer, he announces the uh, steep increase in draft quotas, um, and that, as uh, uh, you know, as you all know, that was a that was a huge um, shift. It was it, it it shifted everything because not only did it put many more people sort of in in line to be draft excuse me to be drafted, but it it increased the sense of we have to do something to protest this war. And so just in, in many ways that, that shift was, was big. Um, you know, all, all kinds of things happened that summer. So reading the papers really gave me a great, a great sense of, um, you know, just of what were people thinking about. And then finally, and I can talk a little bit more about this if people want to, but I thought it would be fun to bring, um, oh, yeah. one of the big ways I, I sort of got to know my characters was through community cookbooks, um, doing research in community cookbooks. And so uh, this is one of my favorite ones, uh, Out of Vermont Kitchens, which you'll see in a lot of, there may be people in this room who have this in their kitchen. Um, but what I love, this one was produced by um, uh, Episcopal women in Burlington and Rutland, who, two churches who got together. But what I love about it is they, the women hand wrote their recipes and many of them have illustrations as well. And so there, it's just this incredible, um, you know, beautiful little illustrations. It's just, it, it was such a fun way to, to just learn about, you know, what kinds of ingredients people were using, what kinds of meals were, were they serving. Um, so that was, that was a really fun part of the research. Yeah, I have to ask, what sure. was your favorite thing that you cooked for the book? For out, of, out of these yeah. books? Um, there's a lot of jello, I have to say. <laughs> that was not my favorite. They were, I mean, really, the 1960s. They did it. It was a lot of jello. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, there's a recipe for baked beans, actually, that is so good that mm. I, it's like become one of my favorite recipes. So I, that was maybe one of my favorites. Um, th uh, lots of, lots of good ones. Yeah. Lots of good ones. Okay. That's so, I love how a book can uh, change your actual daily life in that yes. way, where you read a scene in a book and then you go and cook the meal. And cook. Well, and you wrote a wonderful piece um, at, when Trust Her was coming out about shopping like your characters. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if anyone here is working on a book, but my favorite way to get into a character's head, which I can't recommend more highly, is to grocery shop for him or her. So to actually go to the grocery store and fill a cart with what the person would be buying, um, it really gets you into their body in a way that I think nothing else does to think, okay, this person is coming home from work. She's tired. She's a little lonely. She's very hungry. What will she be buying? And is this person shopping for comfort or is she kind of a like austere eater and she kind of is, is very rigid about it. Um, is she on a really tight budget right now and alarmed at the price of you know, raspberries, as we all are? Uh, mm -hmm. it, and just how, how the person moves through a grocery store feels really um, telling about if they're adventurous, if they're always trying new things, if they really need routine. 
Um, and so I really enjoy doing that for my characters. And then also cooking whatever meals go into the book. Right. Although I did just read a level above this, I think, is there's a writer named Catherine Brendel whose book Impossible Creatures I'm reading right now. And she wrote a book for children set in the Amazon. And she went to the Amazon and she knew that her characters would eat piranha. And so she mm. caught and ate piranha, yeah. which is just, I mean, She's just really going for it. And I very much admire that that dedication. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I do recommend it. it. Should we talk a little bit about process and sort of yeah. how how we get um, how do you get how do you get a novel done? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's, not question. An, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like yeah. what's your what's your process? So my process is uh, very inefficient and. Um, a bit painful because I write longhand and I tend to not know if my ideas are good until three or four months down the line, sometimes longer, and oftentimes they're not good and the idea has collapsed. And it's sort of like you're in a house and you're trying to build the house and it's just falling in on you. Um, and that at that point you have to stop and choose a new project. Uh, and that has felt very difficult because I have little kids. So often I am paying for childcare while building the house that will then collapse on me. <laughs> uh, but I think at this point, I've learned that all of that work then feeds into the, to the real project in some way. So it's all right to have an idea that seems like you just wasted eight months, but one character or one image will kind of feed something in the next project. Um, and it's also then really, really gratifying when an idea finally sort of ignites and you just know that, you know, it feels like you've come home and you can live in this world for the next two years or so. Um, I also find it so strange that we do this where we make these imaginary friends and then have them have things happen. <laughs> and it's so satisfying. It really does feel um, really deeply satisfying to create a character and really be living alongside her um, and sort of thinking constantly how she would be responding to something. Mm -hmm. So usually what I do is I write longhand. I don't know what will happen after the scene I'm working on. And then when I reach the end of the scene, I sort of think, okay, what will the character do now? How will she respond to what just happened? Or what's the worst thing that could happen now? Or where where is the story going to go next? And then at the end of that, I type it all up and then um, do a lot of revision with friends like Sarah, who are brilliant writers, and will help me see plot holes and sort of figure out where things should go. Um, and one thing that I recommend really highly that a professor told me is to always print out your whole draft mm -hmm. and go sit somewhere without a pen and read it from start to finish and pretend that you're coming to it as a reader. And when you do that, you don't tweak at all you're not sort of correcting a comma, you're actually seeing the whole kind of forest instead of getting lost in the trees, and then you know how to revise it based on that. You know where the energy is, and you know where it's flat. Um, so that, that seems like a pretty big turning point. That's great, right. that's great advice. That's great yeah. advice. Um, yeah, you know, the thing of knowing when to abandon a project <laughs> is, I think that's one of the hardest it's one of the hardest things to learn as a writer and to be okay with it, to get to a point where you're okay with it. And it's funny, I was just remembering um, when I had, my oldest child was three and I was pregnant with my second child and my husband gave me for Christmas this wonderful gift of a like four day writer's retreat at this beautiful place in Quebec. It was the loveliest gift. It was like, you know, I'd been complaining about how I could, how I didn't want to write, and how, you know, or how I didn't feel like I could write. And, and you know, we, we were having a, a new child arriving soon. And so it was like, this was it. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being on that writer's retreat and realizing that the thing I'd been working on was not mm -hmm. working and I had to give it up. <laughs> and it was, the, it was horrifying, you know, because yeah. it was like, I could, it was almost like I could feel the, the money ticking away, <laughs> you know, of like how much he'd spent on this writing retreat, you know. And then I just sort of came, you know, I, I like came to this place of peace about it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, stopping now is going to allow you to get to the, the actual mm -hmm. project faster. And, and once I sort of realized that it was, I was yeah. okay with it, but it's a, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. Um, so 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I, um, I, I writing longhand just, I'm, it, it's amazing to me. I, like, I, I just, I love hearing about people who do that, and I could not do, I could not do it for some reason. Typing is like the thing that makes the, the stories come. I don't know. There's some, there's some connection there. So, um, I generally start a book with, you know, in writing series. I sometimes know a lot because it's a continuation of another book and I already have a lot of the characters and the setting, but I'll start a book sort of with the setting and the characters and generally a scene. Like I've, I, like I generally know a a scene and, and, you know, often it is the sort of discovery of the body or the, you know, the, the initiation of the mystery. And I'll start writing with that. And I, all, I usually will get to about 50 pages just sort of on, you know, just on inspiration. And then I absolutely come to a screeching halt at 50 pages and have no idea what happens next. And I, I don't know where to go. And so that's when I will kind of stop. And I'm not exactly an outliner, but I'll do a little bit of planning ahead. You know, I'll kind of think, okay what, you know, where's, where's this going? And, and more, most importantly, I think for, for mystery, like what's the backstory, right? How did all these characters get here? What happened? What, what went wrong? You know? And, yeah. and then I find once I've kind of gotten a loose sense of that and of where the characters end up, then I can start writing ahead. Um, you know, and it's not terribly efficient. My first drafts are awful my first drafts are really messy because I find it important to just like get through them and to kind of have something to to revise um but but that's yeah and re and a lot of revision yeah. I love I love revision I mean revision is for me kind of like where the writing happens in a sense mm -hmm. um that's where I feel like I actually enjoy the process of writing yeah um, yeah um I was gonna ask also with because you mentioned, because it's a mystery, you sort of need to know who people are and where they're coming from and where they will be going. So if you could talk about how you chose to make a home in this genre and yeah. what you love about writing yeah. thrillers and mysteries. Cool, and then I wanna hear, yeah. hear from you on that too. Um, yeah, you know, I, in, in college, I wrote a lot of stuff, including um, my, my fabulous college creative writing professor is here, so I'm gesturing towards him. Um, <laughs> including, you know, uh, a lot, probably what, what you would sort of call more in the space of literary fiction. Um, I wrote short stories and uh, I had a, you know, there was a novel I was working on. Although I think I always had like a little, there's always mm. like a little bit of crime in my, <laughs> you know, there's always like a little mystery, a little, uh, I was interested in kind of, the, you know, that sense of like something going really wrong with the social fabric, you know, I was just, I think I just was always, always interested in that. Um, and I loved reading mysteries. You know, I, I, I think I, for a long time, I was like a little ashamed that that was my sort of comfort reading or like my go-to reading. Um, and then I started to learn much more about, about the history of the genre. And, um, you know, I kind of started right at the beginning and started reading Poe and, Doyle and like going all the way through, you know, and really like going deep on, um, on sort of noir and the evolution of the, you know, of, of the genre. Um, and I had, so I'd been working on a novel that was long and kind of open-ended and I was really struggling to, to get past page 50. Um, and I was, I was in a terrible car accident. I was in a very, very bad car accident that I walked away from with, you know, miraculously with very few injuries. And I had one of those moments where I was sort of like, if I'm going to finish a book, this, I've got to do it. Like the, I, who knows what, what can happen? You know, when you have an experience like that, you sort of, I think sometimes you, you kind of just clear away all the excuses and you say like, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do this. And, um, I, I just said, I'm going to try writing a mystery novel because I love reading them and it would, you know, I'm just going to see if I can do it. And I felt all this momentum. Mm -hmm. I felt all this, um, there was an urgency to it that I hadn't felt in some of the other things I'd written. And, 
so I, so I think that's how, you know, and it was the first book I sold was in, was in the genre. So, um, so yeah. And what, how, how, what about you? I mean, I, I feel like you're, you're not quite as like firmly within, mm -hmm. within the, the mystery genre. Um, you're, you know, certainly your, your first novel, uh, you know, I think is, is there, but then you've kind of flirted with espionage mm -hmm. more than I have. flirted, I have. more than flirted with espionage. Um, but yeah, what, how do you think yeah. about genre and what, what do you, what, how did you come to it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because it feels like ordinary life feels really kind of lurid and violent also. Like, I, I think that I don't see a very clear divide often between um, the material that could be in a crime novel and the material that could be in a kind of state of the nation novel, um, especially where we live. No, not particularly in Woodstock at this point in time, <laughs> but we live in a country that is really highly criminalized and has a huge prison system. And this is something that we live with on a daily level. Um, and especially, I started my first novel when I was in my mid twenties and I had sort of hit a point of becoming very, very angry about how much awareness I had to have about personal safety and the threat mm -hmm. of violence. Um, and how just commonplace it was that all of my friends had sort of strategies, uh, like carrying keys between their fingers or um, calling someone on the phone when they're in a taxi or checking the locks in a taxi, and how those kind of reflexes are really draining and really grating, and they made me really angry, and they still make me really angry. Um, and so I think I wrote my first novel in a kind of like rage, um, and also to try to get some catharsis and to have some sense of how you could still have justice or truth and how you can kind of hold those up against all of this kind of exhausting nonsense that women deal with. Um, and then it also similarly created this huge kind of force for the project because I didn't know what had happened and I wanted to figure it out as well. Um, the writer Sophie Hanna who writes mysteries said that she thinks people love mysteries because our whole lives are a series of mysteries we can't answer from, you know, will we get this job interview callback? Will the person I go on a date with like me? Um, is this melanoma or is it a freckle? You know, and we're constantly just sort of having these questions that no one can tell us the answers to. Um, and so it's very, very comforting to sit down with a book where you know at the end you will find out something um that you've been kind of wondering about there will be some resolution so i also feel um just a real kind of calm with that yeah, yeah that's that i i hadn't heard the sophie hannah thing but yeah. i you know i think i think there is something about the structure of of a crime novel mm -hmm. that it you know it, it replicates something really primitive for us i think about you know kind of mysteries and you know, wandering in the darkness <laughs> um, and coming into the light and possibly justice being served. You know, there's this, I, I think there is this real sense of that structure just being being very satisfying. Um, and of course, then there, there are a lot of people who are playing with that structure mm -hmm. and, um, you know, to, to varying degrees of success. But, you know, there, I, you know, I, I know people who have written mystery novels where it's left a little ambiguous at the end what, you know, actually what happens. And some people love it and some people are really angry at not having that, mm -hmm. that, you know, getting the truth at the end or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know of one book in particular where I think so. the author has had many livid emails right. and messages. Right. <laughs> people trying to figure out what had happened. What happened? Yeah. What, what do you mean here? Um, should we, should yeah. we see if there are any questions and then we can talk about anything else that you want more? Uh, yeah, Lind. Um, for Ms. Barry, um, mm -hmm. I'm really curious about working in the law, you know, translation, oh, yeah. because that just means, like, I would think you have to do revision, you do revision quite hard, mm -hmm. and does it fly wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually have my draft in my bag and I would show it to you if it was here. But it's funny because I work often at the Dartmouth Library and I think that the college students must think I'm crazy because I'm there with just, you know, like printer paper and a ballpoint pen, <laughs> just scribbling furiously. Um, 
looking unwell. Yeah. And but yeah, it just really I really love it. I think it feels like in fiction I'm always trying to get to the point where I'm writing someone else's diary or someone else's confession mm -hmm. and doing longhand helps me connect with the person and get into that sort of state where I can feel the kind of mysteries of what is going on in her consciousness. Uh, and then I also listen to the same songs on repeat. So I have usually three songs per book and, it, and they'll be matched to different moods of different scenes. And I listen to them on repeat while I'm writing. And something about the music going at the same time as the, my hands going feels really satisfying. Yeah. I have one more question. Yeah. And that is you mentioned that you start with a scene and you don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. next. But what is the, the germ of mm -hmm. your idea? What do you actually start with? Mm -hmm. You can write that scene. Is it a character? Is it a, an interest like trouble? Mm -hmm. What is it? Yeah, um, usually it is a lot less than you would think, and then it changes and shifts. Um, for Northern Spy, I knew that I wanted to write about two sisters and the troubles. Um, and then a lot changed, yeah, yeah. And with my second book, I knew that I wanted to base a novel on this actual case that occurred in England and fictionalize it. Um, and then with the book I'm working on now, which I'm really enjoying, I started off thinking that I was writing about um, a situation based on this actual scenario, but um, in the Faroe Islands, and now it's set in DC. So who knows how that happened, but I'm really loving it. It was always meant to be set in DC. The Faroe Islands have nothing to do with the plot. Uh, and it's just funny how you can shift, you know, several thousand miles over the course of a, from one scene to the next. Um, oftentimes also while I'm writing, I'll have a character say something or think something. And then immediately the character is correcting me and saying, no, I'm not a veterinarian. I am X, Y, Z. So that feels like a, a kind of feedback with the character. Good. <laughs> yeah. But did you did you already know how it happened, or did you um, have the when you started the book? Did you already is that like the thing you focused on, or did you focus on like the people and the you know thing happened and someone died? How? What was the order? Yeah. So with with Agony Hill, I didn't know what happened. Okay. I you know until. I think later in the process than usual for me. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that it would, the, um, the death, the, the, you know, the suspected murder in Agony Hill um, is, was sort of, you know, I, I hesitate to use the word inspired, but was suggested by um, something that happened mm -hmm. in Weathersfield, Vermont in, I know what that is. you know what it is, the, the Romaine Tenney yeah. um, death. And so, for those who don't know, Romaine Tenney was a farmer in Wethersfield whose land was to be seized for the interstate. And instead of giving it to, to, to the federal government um, willingly, he, um, he set his barn on fire with, uh, with himself inside it. And it, you know, so I, I knew, and it just, it was such a sort of powerful act and such a powerful statement against you know, the, the, these interstates coming through that were going to change everything. And uh, in, in his mind anyway. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to kind of have this situation kind of suggested by that. And what I didn't know was what had actually happened. You know, so there was kind of the, all these assumptions and, and, you know, people thought they understood what was going on. And then I had to figure out, I had to get to know the characters before I could figure out what actually had happened. Um, and so it was, it was considerably later, I think, than in some of my other mysteries where I've really started knowing, who, who, you know, who done it and why. Um, yeah. I was wondering about that and having 
yeah. really like it. So mm -hmm. this question is for Flynn. Mm -hmm. um, if it's too personal, don't answer it. But I have another <laughs> book yet, and I want you to you tell us what the three songs are that you were oh, repeating yeah. so that um, when I read it, I can see if I relate to them? <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's funny because now I have the songs for my new book. Um, no, for this book. Right? Yeah, so there's a song by Hazy. Wait, Hazy. Hazy. Yeah called Cosmos. Um, there's a song called All Is Not Lost by Tony Anderson. And there's a song by Max Richter. That, I'm going to forget the name of, even though it's oh, it's there. The <laughs> yeah, I will find it for you. Um, and it also feels like they all have different gradations. So if there's a scene that's particularly kind of um, big and moody, it will be the sort of more cinematic stronger song and then there are kind of more minor key songs that are a little bit gentler um, for interludes. I that, yeah. Um, idea that that's really fascinating. Yeah, I recommend it. It really feels like then you're back into whatever scene you were just working on again uh, from where you left off. Because often, uh, you know, you have to stop writing a scene and go pick up your kids from school or go to work and you're kind of um, dragged out of it and it can feel kind of abrupt so it's nice to have another kind of rope to get back inside. Yeah. No, I like that. It's funny. I, I have trouble listening to music while I'm writing. Yeah. Like I, it's just, it's too, I really like silence. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to, I, for exactly that reason, like I want to have that as sort of a way to fall back into the mood and it's just, it's never quite worked for me. Yeah. But maybe I need to keep trying. Yeah. Thanks. Wonderful. I have a question for both of you. Um, I know with children and just, you know, really life, it's hard to have a routine, but in the best of, if you had it your way, what is your writing routine? Is it after coffee in the morning? Is it in the evening? Or do you try to put in a certain number of hours a day? What is the ideal for you for the writing life for yourself? Yeah. Do you want to go, go first? first? Go first. Yeah. Um, so I love. I'm. A, I love the early mornings. I, you know, my perfect writing day would be to get up at five a.m. and have coffee and just, you know, before the, anything else is happening, um, to just get lots and lots of words down in the early morning. Um, you know, that rarely happens <laughs> these days. Um, and so, I, you know, my writing day basically sort of, I think, like you, kind of mirrors the school day, you know, that um, I, I kind of get everybody. Um, I've got two, ki two kids in two different high schools that are like in opposite directions right now. So <laughs> my morning driving routine is wild. And, um, what, you know, so it's sort of once I get back from getting kids to school, then I have kind of the school day, you know, until like. 2.30 or 3 and to write. But yeah, my favorite is, you know, early morning, especially when it's like a little cold and I can stoke the wood fire, get the coffee and kind of settle down in, um, in, the, in the quiet to write. That's ideal for me. How about you? Oh, wood fire sounds very, yeah. sounds very appealing. Oh, I think my ideal time would be about like 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. and kind of dusk. There's something about the uh, twilight hours that I really love while I'm writing. But that is the least sociable time in which you could possibly choose to work, especially <laughs> if you have a family. So I work while my kids are at school, about 10 to 2. And I also read while I'm writing often. I think one way for me to not feel any sort of hesitation about sitting down to write for the day is to have the book that I'm reading alongside me on my desk and to know that I can read a few pages whenever I want. And that's kind of the reward mm -hmm. because it does feel like the the writing comes from reading and it's part of the same conversation with reading and part of the same circle. So blending them together is really helpful. I know you've talked about writing like at the Dartmouth library mm -hmm. or, and I, I was saying that I sometimes have come here to, to write. Um, I also like the Dartmouth library. Um, and that like, there's something about getting out of your house too, that can be really, really yeah. good. I think like I, I find, um, I, you know, writing at a coffee shop or a library or just somewhere that's where you're not sort of surrounded by all of the 
domestic things that need to be done or <laughs> um, or distracting details, you know, is, yeah. can be really, especially at like certain points in the writing process, I find library or cafe writing yeah. is really good. Although I get, I'm very nosy about uh, strangers and I often get distracted eavesdropping. By listening, right? Or I think someone was sort of messaging someone and seemed very nervous about it when I was at the library this morning and I, I invented a whole story for him in my head, which then you know was a bit distracting. Um, yeah, I agree. I do think also it's been helpful, I think as I've gone um, older to realize that it's the writing can happen anywhere. Um, with my first kid, I would write with him asleep on my lap when he was a baby, while he was napping. Uh, and it, that would have seemed impossible 10 years before. Um, but now I think, yeah, the, yes. you can always have a notebook. I, I learned recently that this, the um, idea of a common book was very common in, I think, the 1500s, which was a notebook where you just write down ideas or things you heard that you liked that kind of hooked your attention. And I really enjoy keeping that sort of notebook as well, mm -hmm. just for jotting down something. Yeah, it's true. Parenthood makes you much less precious yes. about writing. It's like you yeah. realize you can get, you know, 15 minutes in the car while you're waiting for someone to come out of something. You know, it's like you can get good writing done in 15 minutes. You yeah. Can, you know? Yeah. That's good. Charlie. Uh, so how do you decide when to stop? Mm. And do you, as Hemingway said, I'd like to stop when the still mm. stuff in the tank is yeah. Do you yeah, want I think, to start with that? So Hemingway, from what I understand, would write for two hours a day and then stop and then like go ski in the woods by himself and drink wine with friends and just live a very um, kind of luxurious life around those very small, short two hours, which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, Roald Dahl also apparently always wrote two hours and no more every day. Um, no, I think it feels sort of nice to to wear yourself out with a scene and to know that it'll, it will get, the bucket will get refilled by the time you sit down again next because things will keep happening to you. You will keep noticing things and there's not sort of an end to writing that you're going to run out of ideas. I find that there's, that I do reach a moment where in a writing session where I sort of feel like I'm doing more harm than good. <laughs> you know, like I really, and I, I really can sense when that's happening and that's when it's, that it's time to stop. And ideally stop before that when, um, you know, when there is a little gas in the tank still and there is, there's something really nice about having, knowing what happens next mm. so that you, and it just, you start, faster the next morning, I think, if you, if you have a sense. So doing like a little thinking before bed about, okay, so what's gonna, what scene am I gonna write tomorrow can be really helpful because then you, you're just kind of like ready to go. Um, but, you know, in a perfect world, yeah, writing two hours a day would be great. But um, I, you know, I, I don't think I could meet my deadlines doing that. And so I need to, I need to spend a little more time on that. And often you stop, like in terms of the big, like when you stop big picture, you stop because somebody it's told due. you you have to yes. turn the book in on a certain date. Otherwise, you just keep going and going. Yeah, and going. yeah I don't, I, this isn't my copy, but usually if I'm reading, I've marked up my published book before I'm reading um, and edited it. Which is insane because the book's done, but you, oh, you can't when help you're reading what, yeah, before and you read aloud. You think, oh, why did I use that word? I could just, you know, it's yeah. all. So you'll start breaking up. Yeah. Any other questions or aspects? I have a question about uh, auditory books and narrators mm. because your Darcy books are narrated by someone with a really nice Irish mm. brogue. Mm. Good question. Yeah, and I know one can talk about this too. Um, so, it, so with audiobooks, it's kind of an interesting thing where, you know, like my my contracts say that I have approval over the narrator, um, 
so generally what happens is they'll send me a few clips, like a few little short clips, and then I can kind of pick the one I like best. But it's really hard. It's a hard thing to do. I, I find it really tricky. And the, I, had an, I, I had one narrator for the first two Maggie Darcy books, um, who I thought did a, did a really nice job. Um, and, but for the third and the fourth, we kind of wanted to switch it up. And there was, um, there was an Irish actress and narrator who I just really liked. I'd heard her read some other books um, by Irish born crime writers that I really liked. And so I asked if we could get her and we did, which was great. Um, her name's Aoife McMahon. And I thought she did a great job. Um, and it was, you know, with the Maggie Darcy books, it's tough because Maggie's from Long Island. <laughs> and yet she's, intera she's interacting with all these different pe Irish people with many different regional Irish accents. Um, and so it's a tricky, tricky thing. And I, I think the first narrator kind of really tried to, to recreate each of the accents and Aoife's interpretation was much, was more sort of, I don't know, it was more, um, it was like a, a, a lighter touch in, in a sense that I thought worked well, where like her Irish accent came through, but then she did a little flatter for the American characters, and it just, I don't know, it, I, I liked it. Um, but how, what about you? What's, what was your yeah. process like, especially for, yeah. for the... Northern Irish books, which mm -hmm. is a very particular accent. <laughs> it is. It's apparently the hardest accent. Um, Brad Pitt played someone from Belfast and apparently oh. just butchered oh. the Belfast accent. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's apparently very difficult. So yeah, I also get sent clips and it feels like a huge responsibility yeah, to choose it's something it's really hard. with these auditions, but I, I really love the voices of the actors who have done it. Um, it also just, I really love that Ann Patchett has like Tom Hanks do her audiobooks or Meryl, Meryl Streep. Yeah. Right. So like if if you can get great. that audition right. vocal clip, you probably should choose yeah. Tom Hanks yes. or Meryl Streep. Yeah. That's what I'd recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Well, we we are happy to sign books if anyone would like books signed or feel free to come over and ask us more questions. Um, but this was so much fun. Thank you. Flynn, and thanks to all of you Sarah. for coming. And thank you. <laughs>